Okay, Scott, we're of a certain age. I look down and I say, hey, some cinder blocks. Not really cinder blocks Not anymore. Not really cinder blocks anymore. Yeah. Um, these are what we call CMU or concrete masonry units. Uh, I think the, the place that we need to start with this is let's talk about the usage of block. Sure. So where do we primarily see the old cinder block, the new CMU? Sure. In, in residential construction, or uh, it'd primarily be used as a foundation uh, component as opposed, as opposed to uh, poured concrete. They'd pour a footer and then we'd use CMUs to build our, our uh, either a stem wall, three foot, four foot wall, say for a crawl space, or even as high as eight, nine feet or more. But that's where we'd see it in residential. In light commercial, it's used a lot as a, as a exterior shell of a building in strip malls, doctor's offices, things like that. And that's where we might see a, a painted CMU or a split face where the texture on the exposed face is a little rough just to give it a little texture and character or even a polished face. Right. But I know in commercial construction we can go a lot higher than eight or nine yeah. feet. Yes, we do. We do. Uh, as in residential construction, uh, we use CMU. We don't use it very much in foundation. Bearing walls, yes. But typically in a commercial structure due to its size and the fact that a lot of our commercial structures go vertical, um, uh, we use concrete. And in here, in our lab, we can see that concrete. Our exterior walls concrete out here underneath the, the door in that's, our sand panels, uh, that's concrete. So that's poured monolithically at one time up to its topmost point where the first floor begins to take off with the steel infrastructure. And behind you, I see CMUs. That's right, because this is not an exterior bearing wall. As you can see up top, you can see our steel cutting through the wall. Yeah, it goes right on through. Right, so what we've done is to use this block as a partition wall. So just a dividing wall between two spaces. Right, right. So we use that a lot in commercial construction because a couple different things. Uh, security, if you want a, a little more of a secured room. Uh, but really it boils down to uh, sound. Sure. And you know, we, we've got a lot of different things that block does. It, it'll carry more weight than a typical uh, studded up wall, partition wall. And durability, right? Oh, if absolutely. We see it in schools, we see it in universities, yes. because as opposed to say an interior finish like drywall that can be dented and, and dinged, blocks a lot, a lot more, more durable. Durable, uh, protect from those, uh, you know, the, you know how students are. And uh, uh, a lot of damage. Uh, you'll see that, you know, we used to build residence halls with a lot of that. Sure. When we went away from plaster and started to use more wallboard, um, they, you know, let's use the block because uh, it definitely is more durable. Yeah, CMUs are used in, in every facet of construction where we're talking about buildings, yeah. not in heavy civil, uh, things like that, but in structure, I mean, we see them in uh, high security facilities, prisons, hospitals, schools, just about everything because they can make a lot of different shapes, a lot of different sizes. This is simply a poured concrete that's been put into a form so they can create all different sizes, different textures, different characteristics that we might need on a job site. Right, right. True, true. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a block, right? So when we, we're talking about a block, we've got all these different types. Like Mark said, we can, we can form them differently, configure them. We have specialty block that are made just for corners. We have jam blocks that are made to go into a door jam that has a finished end on it. Uh, we have uh, our common block, which is called a stretcher. Uh, we've got pilaster blocks, and in a minute we'll take them over and we'll show them what a pilaster is and that we could use CMU for that as well and why we have pilasters in walls. 
Uh, just all these different types of block. But there are some consistent dimensions to a block that we have to address. That's one thing in construction you're going to see a lot of, and that's consistency across different manufacturers for the same material. That way, if we're doing a takeoff uh, or something like that, a quantity takeoff, we know that we have multiple suppliers of the CMU, and our takeoff is still going to be right. accurate no matter who, which supplier exactly. we decide to use. Instead of one manufacturer supplying a block that's, you know, uh, uh, two foot long. Sure as a common block. As a common. You know, so the industry is standardized and on this, this is what we call a stretcher. So I'll tip it up so you can see the top of it. And you can see that we have cores that run through. So these holes that run through the block. And we'll get into why we have that here in a minute. And then you can see we've kind of got a U shape where we have two fingers that come out on the sides of the block. That's so when we put them together in our coursing, we can have what we call a mortar joint. Sure. So that's how we set the block is, is we, we put it in a mortar bed. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's get back to the anatomy and let's talk about some dimensions that we're going to hold uh, consistent across industry. And those dimensions are the height of the block, the length of the block, and then the depth, how thick the wall's going to be, in essence, right? So if we stretch a tape measure across the face of our block, we can start to see what some of these dimensions are. See here that we have, let me back up and say one thing. We have two different dimensions for the block. We have what our nominal dimension is and what our exact dimension is. And the nominal dimension, we have it with lumber as well. Sure. Right? Like a two by four is not a, an exact two inches by four inches. That's not in, our actual. Inside. Right. That's the nominal. So measure. our actual two by four is what? Inch and a half by three and a half. Okay. So we have a similar situation with block, but for different reasons. So our block is typically considered nominally eight inches in height. 16 inches in length, and this is an 8 inch in depth block. We can have a 4 inch block, 6 inch, 8 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, 16 inch. Those are the sizes that I have come in contact with in my time in construction. And when they're listing that size, a, a 6 inch versus an 8 inch, they're really talking about this yes, dimension. The, the, thickness, the, the of the thickness of the wall. The thickness of the wall. What it makes in thickness for the wall. Not, it never changes the eight inch height of the block. And that's a big mistake you guys are going to want to make when you're doing your calculations, is to change the square foot area of the block. Of the face right, of the block. And not changing just the wall thickness. So when we say an eight inch block, it's this dimension. When we say a 10 inch block, it means that it's not the eight inches, it's 10 inches thick. Sure. And makes a 10 inch wall. Okay, great. So now, what are the exact sizes of the block? If we tape it out, we can see that nominally it's considered 16 inches long, but in reality, the exact measurement is 15 and 5 eighths. Same with the height. Instead of eight inches, we've got a 7 and 5 eighths dimension. And it's the same with the thickness of the wall as well. So we're it's seven and five eighths and not eight inches. Three eighths of an inch short right. on our face, on our length and our height. Yeah. And the reason that is, unlike lumber where they just arbitrarily pulled it back and said, we're going to give you less material. In block, it's to accommodate our mortar joint. So we're always going to have a three eighths of an inch mortar joint. And then that will allow us to keep a running bond going while we're laying the block. So we're running bond, just like we talked about with our floor decking and our wall sheathing and our roof decking. We're trying to not have our seams always line up. Absolutely, absolutely. If, if we were to stack the block like this, this is called a stack bond. I just stack one block up on top of another. And we'd go up, and then the next row, go up. 
And sometimes that's done for decorative yeah, purposes. Pretty much, yes. But if we're looking for high strength, that's where we're typically going to see a running bond. Absolutely correct, Mark. Absolutely correct. So now that we've seen what the, uh, the dimensions are, let's talk about why we have the cavities in the block. Absolutely. So as we noted earlier, when you look at the block on end, we've got these holes. So what this allows us to do is, is to grout a wall solid and run reinforcing up through the block. Making the wall even stronger than it already was. Absolutely. Um, as with concrete, uh, it's a wonderful product, but when you put steel in it, it becomes an awesome product. Okay, so it's the same thing with masonry. We can add a lot of bearing strength to a wall so that it could be a foundation wall, Absolutely. right? It could be, and it is residentially, light commercial. You'll see a lot of block work uh, for foundations uh, because we can put any size rebar, as long as it doesn't get bigger than, uh, than the cavity itself, but we could stick, you know, a, a five bar that runs continually up through the entire wall and then use non-shrinking grout uh, to grout this block solid. So now you've used the grout and the rebar to tie the wall together beyond just the mortar joint. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and we have some horizontal reinforcement uh, called Unistrut or Uniwall. Uh, it's a manufacturer's name, you know, but it, what it is, it's masonry reinforcement, lateral reinforcement. Um, and we lay that between the coursing. And what that helps us do is, you know, that um, when we backfill against the wall, what's happening? We're trying to push that dirt through the wall, yeah, we're right? Putting tremendous load. Yeah, the so wall. the vertical and the horizontal reinforcement in the masonry helps us fight that pressure that's trying to come through it. That makes sense. Now are there times where we'd be coming up with a certain with a wall thickness let's say a, a, a 10 inch and then it, we'd step it back to maybe six inches mm -hmm. as we go along. Under what circumstances would we want to kind of create that ledge? Um, when we got let's say uh, we're coming up on a house and the house has a four foot brick wainscot that runs across the front of the house as a decorative feature. So that foundation has to accept that brick veneer, right? So we just created a brick ledge right. that would hold the weight of the brick. Absolutely. Yeah, and I've seen it done on some structures where we've come up and the brick ledge, brick ledge has been reversed. Maybe it's on the inside uh. of the building to hold a floor system or a strut system yes, that's going across exactly. and create a bearing yep. point rather than just a mechanical fastener yep. going into the face of the block. Right, 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 absolutely. And we do do that a lot. You know, create pockets in the block to accept structural members, beams that are coming in. And we, we've got uh, a lot of different types of block we can use. You know, those four and, and they're called soaps. So like if we create a pocket uh, and that beam fills most, comes over most of the bearing on the, on the block, we can use a one inch soap and bring that on the outside of the structure and it looks like it grew there. Sure. So block's an amazing thing because it's really, other than how heavy it is and the physical exertion you have to do to lay it, which since you're managers, you're not gonna have to do it, but is, is, is that you can do pretty much anything with it. It's easy to, 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 to cut, to break, you know, and it, it only goes in one way properly, right? right? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up, Scott, too. As a manager, I think Scott and I feel the same way. It's hard to manage people if you don't understand the complexity of their job. So if you're going to be, say, around a lot of CMU work, ask your boss Absolutely. to work with the field crew for a week or two. Have an appreciation for what it's like to have to lift these, lay these, make it look pretty, make the grout joints or the mortar joints look good, do it all day, every day, for days on end, in usually uncomfortable conditions, what, too hot, too cold, wind. Yep, absolutely. Then you'll have an appreciation for what the crew does, what their specialty is, and you'll be a better manager. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, guys, these things aren't light, and they're hard, you know, it, it is a physical exertion. The average mason commercially, commercially is going to average, depending on the company that you're working with, the average person is going to be able to lay two to three hundred of these a day. 
And if I don't get 200, 300, I'm not going to be making money off of that individual for eight hours of work. Right. You know, so once this goes in and somebody gets good at it, they make it look awful, awfully easy, don't they? Absolutely. But in essence, it really is not an easy task. It's not. And because we're worrying artist. about, as we're bringing that brick up, we're worrying about plumb level, level square. square. And when you're, you're, you're putting a layer on top of a layer, you know, if it's an eighth inch out here and it's another, all of a sudden we're a quarter inch. Yeah, out, the you know? wall so, starts to lean, right. the courses don't level up. And if you look at the wall behind us, you can see how many courses were laid in this wall, how they're carrying it on around the corner. This is the running bond that yeah. you were talking about before. And look how clean and precise all of the joints are. Right, so if we'll have the camera pull in here, let's talk about a running bond. And we were talking about an eight inch offset. What we've done all through the building process on the boiler crib is offset our materials or, or run a solid piece of material off of a joint, you know, over it. Because all we're trying to do is add the greatest amount of, of bearing capacity and things so that our structures stand longer. So with a running bond, I showed you a stack bond where all of these blocks would have just been stacked up on one another. And as Mark said, I'm really not sure of any structural pros to that, but there definitely is an architectural, you know, a design viewpoint to have everything straight, linearly running up. Uh, but for strength, we use what's called a running bond. And you can see that each course is shifted eight inches one way, you know, as we're coming into it. So, once again, we have run a, a solid piece of material across where we have a splice between two, a joint between two blocks. So, by running this over that joint, I've increased the strength of the wall. And we really increase it by running the rebar down through it as well. And then, I, you know, these will stand for quite a long time. Now, Scott, you mentioned a pilaster before. Yes. So, can you show us an example? Yeah, let's of what go to the other side of the lab. Like? Here we have a uh, CMU pilaster, and I think you can see now what a pilaster is. It's a big column of block that's attached, runs the wall, runs the back side of it. So. The purpose of this is to help strengthen that wall? It can be to buttress a wall. We use a lot of that. Um, I've used a lot of buttressing when you're coming in on remodels and you've got failure in a foundation. And instead of tearing the structure down, we can go in and we can use pilasters along out and, and, a, and a few other techniques sure. but, uh, to, to stand a wall up and to keep it up. We can also use a pilaster for a mechanical chase. You know, we, in this case, what we have here, we have our running bond coming across and then we bump out and we have, oh, it looks like to be about a 20 inch pilaster, uh, you know, and probably by 18, 20 there as well. Uh, but look at the top. What do we have coming out of the top of the pilaster there? Yeah, we've definitely got some mechanicals that's, within that pilaster. That's right. We've got 480 volt coming out there. That's a, that's a lot of juice, kids. We don't want to hit that, I can tell you that. Uh, but the chase, the inside of the block is where the conduit runs up, and then it comes through the face, and then there's an outlet. Okay, so that's another purpose uh, that we can use. Now, with the boiler crib, right, uh, or Plan 100, rather, uh, we have pilasters in the masonry. But the purpose for the pilaster is to be the bearing points on either side of the length of the house for the main beam, the floor support beam that runs underneath the flooring system and sits on one pilaster and runs to the other pilaster. So a pilaster could be structural, it could be uh, basically a heavy duty conduit to hide something, yep. it could be architectural, many different reasons right. to use a pilaster. But just remember that we have a couple different types of blocks typically we use. Now we didn't use a pilaster block. We do or we have the ability to buy pilaster blocks. And in I think Plan 100 that pilaster block is a 16 by 16 inch uh, 
square block. Because it's supporting the beam. Right. So we want more contact area, uh, a stronger block. Right, right. And then we, uh, we have on the back side of the pilaster will be two indents so that a key block, and a key block has a fist that comes off the end of it and fits into the pilaster. So it's like a key and a lock, right? And that way, when I'm bringing this wall into my pilaster, I can lock this laterally from pushing this way. If you have a fist coming into a socket, right? And that's because we broke our running bond right. in order to stack up the To pilaster. stack up, have a stack bond of pilaster blocks up. Right. We're going to put rebar in those. We're going to fill it with concrete, and then we're going to run our beam off of it. So Perfect. You have to have a special block, what we call a key block, that fits into the pilaster and then keeps it from being able to shift this way. Because that's exactly what happens when we have a stacked bond. It comes up like this, then the next row stacks on top. Well, where those block meet, if we were putting pressure on the outside of the wall end or vice versa, what's going to happen? There's not a lot of resistance. Right. You're going to be able to split those two runs of block and push it. At the mortar joint. Right. right. But by running a, 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 a a running bond into the pilaster and then using a key block to fit in, we take care of that, that uh, the, the wanting to move laterally in and out of the wall. So it looks like they've used also some type of corner block on this pilaster yes. as well. Instead of having that sharp 90 degree uh, corner right there, it's a softened edge. Yes. And they account for the thickness in the corner block. Right. So we've got four inch block here and it has what's called a bull nose on it. Two different type of corner blocks we can get. We can get them with a bull nose and then we can get it where it's just square out, like a normal just a block. 90 right, degree right, turn. Just a 90 degree turn. Um, this, because of its placement in the lab, you know, they went to a, a bull nose block so people don't get, you know, yeah, knock it. Safer. You might hit it and knock a corner of the block off safer and, and takes a little more abuse with the rounded bull nose. But you can see that's a four inch block. So we have to have a block that isn't like a stretcher, right? Because when we looked at a common block that runs down the coursing of our walls, right. it has that U-shape. So if we had that U-shape on the end of this block, you'd see the A, you know, you'd exposed. see that and it'd look like, you know, Fido's hind end. Right. But instead we can purchase corner blocks that are finished on an end. And it only works on the four inch and the eight inch block. Okay, if we, because remember, uh, we have to have our running bond has to be, you know, if we're doing a long run, that's an eight inch dimension. Right. So here, we've just shifted it to use the four inch because it works out with our coursing, with the, the dimension of it. You got a 16 and a four. Okay. And if we had used eight inch block here, right. if we take our eight inch depth and our eight inch depth, we would have maybe had an inch or two in the middle. Right. By, by using the four inch, we've left that cavity in the middle so they could bring out their electrical service at Let's top. go back over to the mock-up and let's explain corners. That way we can show what we're talking about a little easier. Sounds good. Okay, so what I was saying is, is that Two dimensions have to hold true on our block, right, if we're going to use them. One is this 8-inch thickness. Now, you can see that this block, like the 4-inch block over on the pilaster, is, is different than the stretcher. The stretcher has the ends notched so our block can come together and the mortar has somewhere to smush back into. and provide a better bond between the two block. If we were to just use common stretchers to make a corner, like I was saying, you want to grab that? Yep. Thank you. If I brought that across to make the corner, look what I'm left with. Nice finished nice face. Nice finished block, and then we've got the end of a common stretcher. So, with eight inch block, because that dimension always in an eight inch wall is going to be there, or I shouldn't say, in any wall, the running bond is 8-inch offset, which means we have to be able to run the block to look like that. 
So here we can buy an 8 inch corner block or jam block that has the finish in. See how this works out and looks very nice and finished. So that 8 inch dimension on a corner always has to hold true because it sets the running bond leaving going the other direction. Right. We run into problems when we get into 10 inch block, 12 inch block, 16 inch block, 6 inch block doesn't work like this because this in dimension regardless of what the depth of the block is has to remain the same. Sure. Has to be 8 inches or we can't have a running bond that's aesthetically pleasing like that or our cavities line up over one another properly so we can run rebar. If we shifted you might say, Scott, why can't I just shift two inches yeah. on a 10 inch block? If I slide down. So when it slides down, now we're starting to get in, we're blocking all of our cores down because now I don't, the block was set perfectly to run at an eight inch offset. So we slide back and we get back to our offset. All of our cores line up with yeah. each other and run down. If the camera can down. shoot down the, the block, you can see how the cores line up. Now, if I shift this block, see what happens to my cores? Now, I've got less of an area to get rebar and grout down through. So they designed corner blocks to help us. So if we run, I can pull. This is a 12-inch corner block. And the way it runs. So we get all these weird different uh, configurations. 12 inch block could come in here and butt into it. But you can see that in the corner, it's still the 8 inches. The 12 inch block comes in here, fits into this notch, and then the end of the block, that 8 inches, is finished. See, so if I set that into a corner situation, even though these aren't 12 inch block, it'd come out like this, see? And your 12 inch block? And then the 12 inch block would continue. So the corner block is a bastard size and configuration, but the block, the 12 inch block just come into it. So our 8 and 16 didn't change? Yeah, 8 and 16 inch dimensions. But the thickness of the wall did. Coming out of the corner, 16 inches this way and 8 that way. So what happens is we start the next block like that. Now my running bond's perfect around, not perfect, but 